Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Hi, Steph. It's good to have you with us. It's good for us to be in church together. It's a wonderful thing that we have the ability and privilege to do. And whether you're in church or you're following along online, we're delighted to have you with us. I'm going to take a moment um, and explain what we're doing over Christmas in just a second. But I do want to thank Elaine and her team of people who were decorating on Friday and decorating the church and putting the tree up. I did well to get one tree up in our house. That was a success for me. So the idea of doing another one would be a step too far. Um, it also wouldn't look like this, which is great. It, it just looks super. And thank you so much for the folks who, who decorated the church. Um, this evening, we will gather online at 8 o'clock for Zoom prayer. And we, we'd love you to join with us. We, we have much to pray for in this season of life, both within the church and without. So we'd love you to make that a priority this evening. You'll be off by 9, so you get to catch whatever BBC has on or ITV or whatever that Sunday evening delights are. Um, but it's great to take that focused time and be able to pray. Um, so much of church life, people are missing what's happening with different people because they're not able to see them. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to bring that before God. Over Christmas this year, so there's a note which will probably explain it better in, in the announcements. So do take that and read that. Um, but Christmas services over the next number of weeks will be on the 19th of December. We won't meet in the morning and instead we're going to meet in the afternoon. So the first service will come at half past four for our carol service and the second service will come at half past six. Um, if you have somebody you want to invite, if you have many people that you want to invite, there is more room at the, at the half six service than there is at the half four. Um, but we'd love you to come. We'd love you to come and join us as we sing carols together, as we do. begin to anticipate and to celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day, we're meeting once at 10 o'clock, and instead of having some form of selection service of who gets in and who doesn't get in, which just feels deeply unfair, what we're going to do is steward you as you come in. So I'm aware that at the moment, most of you know where you're sitting on, on the seating plan. What's going to change in the season ahead is when you come to church, stewards will put you in a particular seat, and that means we will fill the pews with the same distancing that we're keeping to at the minute, but we'll fit, we reckon, 128 people in the church building. Which is, a, which is a huge increase on what we currently have. On Christmas Day, we're also going to have the hall. So when you come, you need to have in your head of, you may be in the church building, but you may be in the hall. The service will be streamed into the hall. And I hear you say, possibly, well, I could stay at home and watch it in my pajamas. And I will say to you, as kindly and politely as possible, being together is better than being in the house. Now, you may say, no, it's not, because I can have a cup of coffee or hot chocolate in the house. But you can do that later on or do that before. We'd love you to gather with us and to make that a priority, um, particularly in Christmas morning, but in the, in the weeks and months ahead. So Christmas morning, 10 o'clock, you turn up, we get seated where we are, and we'll have a short service and time together with the restrictions and the masks. They're, they look like they're going to be normal for a while. But the distancing will be the same. That's key, because we're not making that any smaller. But we will tighten it up in the sense of people will sit in every other pew with the maximum amount that we can fit in, um, with the hope, as I say, of getting over 100 in on a regular basis. On Boxing Day, the service will be online only, um, giving people who are making services happen a little bit of a rest after Christmas morning and the services before that. And then on the 2nd of January and then moving forward, the change is we're going to mirror what we're doing on Christmas Day. So well, you, you'll be seated as you arrive. This will be one service at half past 10. You'll be seated as you arrive. We will fill the church, hopefully to about 128. That seems to be it. Maybe a little bit more. It depends on the numbers and how they come in. And then we'll also use the hall. And so what we're asking the congregation to do is really in your head, once every three weeks you'll be in the hall. With other people, you're not on your own. It's not like you've been put in the naughty step or sent out. It's just how we get everybody into the same service at the same time. Um, so this, any solution that we have has a negative. The solution at the minute, the negative is we have two services. We have two groups of people who are worshiping in Glengormley month after month. This enables us to be in one service at one time. The negative is some people are in the hall. What we're going to ask is people would just say, no, no, I've been in the church. I need to be in the hall now. And we'll rotate that round. But it means we can be together. Because some of you haven't seen your pals in church in 20 months. That's a long time. It's a long time not to see people. This means that we at least get to see each other again and to be in the same place at the same time. Does that make sense? Session are very aware that any solution has a negative. That's what's really hard in this. Any solution, we, we've discussed for a long time on many Tuesdays, any solution has a negative. This also has a negative, but what we're currently doing at the minute also has a negative. So we need to change that in order to try and achieve the solution of everybody being together more than we currently are. So that'll be our, that's our plan for January. Obviously, if the executive decides to do something else, I'll stand up and tell us whatever the executive have told us to do. But until that point comes, that's our plan for the season ahead. And we'd love you to, to make that a priority over the season ahead that we'll be able to gather uh, and worship together. Rebecca is leading us. Oh, sorry, I'm going to read before Rebecca leads us. Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> 
and the start of Luke. An angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And this is the God we worship this morning. And Rebecca is leading us. Good morning. Uh, Stand with us as we sing this together this morning. together. Let's come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Christ has satisfied you and answered the call for your justice. And that it is Jesus who delivers us from our sins. The Christ does not desire that we would love in our own strength, but gives us the law of the spirit of life to enable us to obey you. We thank you that because of Jesus, our lives are changed and renewed. We thank you for the spirit of life that we can know through your life, for you, through your birth, life, resurrection, that you died for us, that you rose again. We thank you that that brings into reality in our lives new and lasting life for each of us. We thank you for the kindness that you offer us in Jesus, that we find rest in him. We pray that you would help us this morning as we gather for worship, that we would see Jesus clearly and in fresh ways that we would respond to the gift of Jesus by saying thank you for your grace and kindness. But we'd also declare your glory 
that has moved through the universe and into our lives. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. The boys and girls are going to go out to glow. is leading us. How lovely it is to be here this morning, surrounded by the lovely Christmas decorations. It really is starting to feel so festive and so Christmassy. So this morning, as we sing together, let's fix our eyes on Jesus and keep him at the center of all of our celebrations this festive period.
This morning we're pausing Nehemiah as we turn towards Christmas and we're going to begin to look at some passages in Isaiah and how um, they show us Jesus clearly. So we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear forth, will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people's The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. And this is our reading for this morning. Isaiah lived 700 years before the birth of Jesus. He was a prophet who brought God's word to his people, at times of judgment, at times a message of hope. Isaiah uses language incredibly well to give us these God-given pictures and images of the world where people would be in, but he's also foretelling the world of God's Savior coming. And so this Advent, we're going to look at some of the long-awaited good news of Jesus foretold by Isaiah, and also how that came to be in Jesus, and then hopefully what that means for us in 2021. And so in Isaiah 1, we have a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. We had a bush at our front door, it was overhanging um, as I came out of the house, and in in the end of the summer, I hit my head twice on it as I left the house. And in probably what was a little bit of frustration and anger, as I came back to the house, the bush is no longer there. It is now just a stump at our front door. I was was annoyed at just getting poked in the head every time I was leaving. Everybody else was fine. But if you come to our house, you'll see there's a stump there. There's a little bit of it left. And there's shoots now growing out. I didn't dig down into the foundations. I haven't removed it at the core. I've just cut it back enough so it doesn't poke me in the head when I leave the house. And you'll know this in your own garden if you've ever cut anything back of any size or substance that if you leave it for a little while, little shoots start to come back out again and it begins to regrow. The Bible uses picture language so we can understand something. I want you to see that behind that what we have is this picture of God wanting human beings to know. So Isaiah uses lots of picture language to describe things, but the space behind that is that God wants us to know. Occasionally, I meet people who say, I don't understand the Bible, and there certainly are parts that are very, very difficult to interpret or to understand. But often in the picture language, the difficulty isn't understanding it. It actually is quite clear what it's giving a picture of. We can see that. But I'd love you to hold in your head, the reason for the picture language is because God wants people to know what he's saying. And so Isaiah says, out of David's stump will grow a shoot, The picture language is of a person who will be a descendant of David. Out of the line of David will come a shoot, will come a stump. Will come a shoot from the stump. But I want to slow down slightly because David was a royal family. Yes, he was king. 
But in case you have an idea of Bible languages or Bible families being perfect, David's family was not perfect. So you can, you can balance this against your own family history. In David's family, they had relatives kill each other. They had adultery. They had affairs. They had children sleeping with their father's wife. They had in-house family rivalry that led to war. There were um, situations of sexual assault. David's family, I think, by any modern definition, would make the East Enders Christmas special or the Hollyoaks Christmas special. It is a mess of what they did to each other. Even David's successor, Solomon, had 700 wives. I think that's just greedy by any definition. It's incredible. You don't get a sense of faithfulness in David's family. David is faithful, but in amongst their faithfulness and heart for, heart for God, you also have these incredible carnage moments where things are not right and are not as they should be. And so as a family tree, it was full of love and of hurt. At times there was forgiveness and at times failure. You may not have those precise things in your family. But you do know love, hurt. Hopefully you know forgiveness. We all certainly know failure at various points. Family life can be considerably harder than we make it look on the outside. Whatever form or, or, or age or stage your family is at, we know the burden of family life. I think it's important when we think of the shit coming out of David's stump that we don't go, yeah, but he had it all together. Because that's not the picture that the Bible gives us. It's really clear that David's family did not have it all together. Our family and King David's family are not perfect. But then we have in Isaiah 11, this moment when out of the mess of the stump of David's family tree will come a shoot. The picture language is there is this new branch. Out of the stump of David's family tree comes the shoot of Jesus' forever love because Jesus goes to forever lengths for us. And on this shoot of new life, the baby Jesus as we have it, we have this description in Isaiah of the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And that is the picture that Luke gives us 700 years later in Luke chapter 2 where it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You see in the Jesus part of the story the fulfillment of what Isaiah is predicting 700 years before. <coughs> Isaiah gives us this clear description of new life coming out of the stump of David's family line. And the one who will come in righteousness and faithfulness he will wear them like clothes to do right on the earth. He will judge the needy. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Isaiah then gives this incredible graphical illustration of what shalom looks like, of wholeness and harmony in the world. And it seems almost ridiculous as we read it in the 21st century because the picture is of wild animals and children playing. And nobody would consider that being a good idea. Every so often you see a viral picture of somebody jumping somewhere in the world into a zoo enclosure, and within seconds things go very, very badly as the animal that is wild either chases or um, mangles the adult who is thought he'd be smart by jumping the fence. But the picture in Isaiah is of children and wild animals at play, of peace, of deep wholeness happening in the world that looks so different to the world that we live in. And it's not a on your best behavior moment or don't mention the war during the Christmas dinner to get through a family time together. It's not that. It's this picture of deep, deep wholeness and harmony within relationships, even within the natural world. This is the image of Jesus as Jesus coming. The picture is of that deep shalom coming. He brings the ability and the power to set the world right, deeply right. We live in a part of the world that desperately needs the world to be set right, but so does the rest of the world. When you watch global and local national news at the minute, there is so much happening that you go, this is not right. This is not as it should be. And yet Isaiah gives us this picture where there is no conflict even in the natural world. That's the incredible level of peace that God will bring whenever he comes. It looks very different to the peace in King David's family that we read in the Old Testament, but it also looks very different to the peace that we have in our own families. You might have peace at some level, but it's not the same level of peace as what Isaiah is giving. That's the promised picture of Jesus coming and the peace that Jesus brings into lives. And so we see that in the birth of Jesus, that he is the shoot, the new life born to us, growing in stature and wisdom and favor with God as the fulfillment of that. But even further in Jesus' life, Isaiah is signposting us, I think, to John 15, where Jesus declares, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We have this incredible fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy that we see in the figure of Jesus. But Jesus even goes further and he names it himself. I am the vine. I am the one that has life. And you can have life when you remain in me. Even to go as far as to give the opposite view of if if you don't remain in me, you can do nothing. The picture we have is what life looks like when it is in Jesus. Jesus wants us to be connected to him. That's the picture language that Jesus gives us in John's gospel. It's not say this phrase. It's not if you say this prayer. It's not do you have the right books in your home or even do you come to church on Sunday. It is remain in me. The old language would be abide with me. The new language has live in me, be joined in me. But you have this picture of connectedness to Jesus. That's what Jesus speaks of as being the key of the fulfillment of Isaiah that you see in the birth of Jesus, but you see in Jesus explaining it explicitly for us. Jesus wants us to be connected to him, connected to the vine. He keeps the gardening theme from Isaiah of the stump and the new shoot all the way through. Are you a sapling? The language that Jesus gives us is this idea of being engrafted into the vine, that you as the shit are being put into the vine so that the sap, the lifeblood of the vine, is moving through you if you are in Christ. It's a deep interconnected picture of what it is to be a Christian. It's not the idea of, well, I said something a long time ago, or I pray now and again, or even I read my Bible. It is that my life is connected to Christ's. That's what Jesus tells us in John 15. And I think that's really the heart of being a follower of Jesus, is that you are so connected to him that he is flowing through you as you live your life. We need to be honest. We are still frail. We are still broken. We still fail. But the truth is is that we are in Christ. We are not perfect. We still, some days on a bad day, may look more like David's stump, as it's described in Isaiah. But the picture is, is that Christ is flowing through us because we have surrendered ourselves to him, that we are his, that we are in him, and he is also in us. And Isaiah 11 has, in verse 15, I didn't read that far because it's quite hard to read Isaiah publicly, but at the end of Isaiah 11, 15, it says, the Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the river, river Euphrates. He will break it up into seven streams, so that anyone can cross over in sandals. It's the picture language of any barrier to getting to God being broken up so that anybody can get there, even in your sandals. There's no barrier. The barriers were the big rivers, the idea that you couldn't get to where God was. And what Isaiah gives us the picture language of is that Jesus will break this apart so much so it's just like coming across a little stream. This is for absolutely everybody. Being connected and in Jesus is for everyone. There are a number of ways that we can apply this in our lives today. I'd love you to hear clearly that coming to Jesus is for everyone. That Jesus is open for absolutely everyone. And part of the thing goes right back to David's family because God was using his family even in the car crash of their family relationships and the stuff that they did. There's nothing in your history and nothing in your background that stops you coming to Jesus because God was using David's family and all of the mess of his family to do his work and to bring about the birth of Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes it easy for us to come to him because he is the one who has done everything for us in order to come to him. He is the one who, as we sing this morning, was born for us, lived, died, and then as we will celebrate at Easter, was resurrected, having taken all all of the damage that you cause in the world onto him. You might say, you don't know what I've done or you don't know what I really think, but I would say, my background's not, my background's not great either. David's background wasn't great either, and yet the picture is, is that this is open to absolutely everyone to be connected to Jesus. You might, as you sit here this morning, as we hear more news of COVID, but also just life is hard, even wider than COVID. Life is often hard. 
And you might feel like a stump this morning. You might feel cut down or cut back to keep the picture language or damaged or dry or a bit crusty. But the good news of Advent, the good news of the birth of Jesus is that new shoots come from stumps. That's where they come from. At my front door, if you want to call around this afternoon and say it, you'll say it yourself. You'll say it in your own garden. Out of people who are tired and weary comes new shoots because that's what Jesus does in our lives. He bears fruit as John describes it. We bear fruit in our lives because he is the one giving us the power in our lives. It's not Oprah and you can do better. It's not pull your socks up and keep going in COVID. It's Jesus being in us and us remaining in him and Jesus flowing through us and in our lives we're able to bear fruit. How do we bear fruit? We receive the good news of Jesus coming but we also see in our humble lives that we are able to love others in a way that we can only do because we know the love of Jesus. And so it encourages us, I think, this Advent as we think about services, but as we think of the real purpose of what, what we're celebrating, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of, of homework, possibly, because maybe this is really real for you. In which case, you need to look around the world and see people whose lives are currently stumps, and they really need new shoots. But they'll only really find new shoots in Jesus, because he is the only one who has the power to turn this around. He is the only one in that lifeblood connection to be able to change people's lives. Changed David's family's life, changed, well, Jesus coming, changed Mary's family life, but it changed our lives as a result. And so the homework would be to think of two or three people who you know, and the best Christmas present they could have this year is coming to know Jesus for themselves. And the homework, quite simply, is to begin to pray for them every day. And as you're praying for them that they would come to know Jesus for themselves, think about inviting them to the carol service. I think carol services are fairly harmless. But as the Archbishop of Canterbury said, there's nothing more dangerous than a carol service. He says, it's the most dangerous thing we do in the year because we tell people that God has come. And so as you think of being connected to Jesus, I'm going to encourage you this Christmas, and I realize people will be going, where are we going to put them? We'll fit people in where we can fit them in. But encourage people that you know who don't know Jesus to go come to our carol service. Come and just sing some carols. You don't have to tell them that we're going to tell them about Jesus. That'll be fairly obvious by the carols that we sing. But we want to connect other people into the life of Christ. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for David's family. We thank you for Isaiah's words where there are new shoots coming out of stumps. That you use families of all shapes and sizes and backgrounds to do your work in the world. We thank you for our church family. We thank you that in and through Jesus, we can know new life in our own lives. And Father, may this Christmas for those we love become the Christmas where they really do accept the gift of Jesus to their lives. And they can be in Christ, having his life flowing through us. Father, for some of us, this is the good news that we need to hear ourselves this morning. That you are the one who brings new life. That you are the one sent by God because God wants us to know that you want us to be with you where you are. Help us as we pray for those we love. Help us to take opportunities to invite them to our carol service, to invite them into other services in church life, but even just to name that this is how we see the world to those we love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final praise. Thank you.
and we say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.